So we put, uh, on Monday at the end of the hour, we put on these, this whole set of fearsome equations with sums and integrals and we had, um, you know, some general system. It might have multiple flows going in that we would have to sum over. We have J1, 2, 3, 4 going in. We have all the flows going out. <laughs> uh, look at these windows and things. So, uh, okay, so we have J flows going in, J flows going out, and then we have a whole bunch of reactions uh, K going on inside the system. <coughs> and uh, so we get these giant equations. This is the mass balance for a component. Uh, on the left, we have the accumulation, the final minus the initial, over some time period from time zero to time final. And then each of these streams, we can, we can integrate our mass flow rate from initial to final time. We can sum over all the streams in, say we the streams out, we can integrate from the beginning to the end of time, and then sum over all the streams out. And then for each reaction K, we use this extent of reactions I dot. All of these can be functions of time, right? This is a function of time. That's a function of time. That's a function of time. And then for each reaction, we use the stoichiometric coefficients to tell us how many moles react. And then we use the mass to tell us the mass of that component. We integrate over time, sum up over all the reactions, and that total gives us the accumulations. <laughs> the whole thing, the accumulations are ins, minus our outs plus our generation and minus consumption, which we put together in that single reaction term. Cool? Okay, so the equation's big, uh, but it's a good starting place to organize, and then we can, we can chop it down. These are uh, transmembrane proteins called G-coupled, G-protein-coupled receptors. Uh, so this is the cell membrane. So these are proteins that sit in the membrane, and they're essentially sensors that sense things going on in the environment. Uh, they have the structure of them. You can see these alpha, these helices uh, in the in the protein. There's seven of these going back and forth, and this turns out to be a real general form for uh, membrane proteins. Membrane is hydrophobic, and you, you need to keep the protein going through. So you have some hydrophilic parts in the top and hydrophilic parts in the bottom, and you get uh, those going through. So it, it, it turns out so G protein coupled receptors are the receptors that bind small molecules, and then these small molecules will change the conformation of this protein. So here's without the small molecule, here's with the small molecule. And if you look from the inside of the cell, so this is the cell's viewpoint, you see one thing, and then you see something else as it opens up. So it makes this big conformational change. And then what happens is G proteins are coupled to these and come in and, and, and bind. And in, in one conformation, the G proteins don't bind, you don't react, and another side they do. And um, this conformational change allows a GTP exchange factor to exchange, like a GAF or a, a GTP, GDP exchange factor to exchange GDP for GTP. So this is guanidine diphosphate, guanidine triphosphate. So these are, this is the base in DNA with different numbers of phosphate groups. But this is often used for signaling inside the cells. You change the number of phosphates, it makes it more negative and it changes what these things can bind to. So it often starts these signaling cascades that go down and change transcription. So these things are used to detect light, uh, smell, so, so uh, rhodopsin in your, in your, uh, in your, back of your eyeballs um, is a 7 transmembrane protein, and then the small molecule is actually a, a photosensitive molecule that absorbs a photon and then changes conformation and does this. So you can detect light with one of these proteins, Smells, your nose and your tongue are filled with these. Uh, hormones are often sensed with these, and neurotransmitters, so uh, dopamine uh, and, and uh, acetylcholine are, are both sensed by these seven transmitters. So these are pretty important proteins, so this is why this got the Nobel Prize. Uh, Robert Lefkowitz and Brian Kabilka determined these structures, which is no small feat. Uh, we usually get structures of proteins by making them crystal of proteins, and then you shoot x-rays through them, you get scattering patterns, and you back out the regular structure of the proteins. But you have to have a three-dimensional crystal, so you have to have proteins that can line up next to each other. So that's already tricky with solution proteins, we've done that a lot of times, but for membrane proteins, to get these to crystallize is kind of crazy. So what they did is they used detergents and things to get it out of the membrane, 
put a little bit of soap around the outside that are supposed to be oily, and then they got these to crystallize. Anyway, so that, that's that story. Um, why, why, why is this important to Kennedy? Well, it's, it's actually really important to my lab right now. We've been turning a lot of attention to membrane proteins because they're, um, it's not really known how to calculate the structures of these or how they bind or how they interact because the mem the, this environment, the membrane, is always changing. It's fluctuating. It's dynamic. It's hydrophobic. And there's not a lot of knowledge about how these work. So this is a huge effort in my lab to determine membrane protein structures and interactions and design them. Um, well, broadly, 40% uh, of drugs target these. These are sensors for the cell, so it's a great place to tell the cell to do something different. <coughs> and uh, that's how this connects to the, the problem. So if you want to so if you want to get drugs to one of these sensors, all right, I messed up my equations again. This is an exponential error. Um, so so if you want to get drugs into these sensors, and you want to block one of these transmembrane. Uh, uh, channels and send this signal or stop this signal from being sent. Uh, so we do that with small molecules. You can, uh, uh, or, or hormones or other things like that. So uh, one of the issues is you want to get the dosage right. You want to have enough but not too much for side effects and you don't want it too low that you're not going to get the effect. Um, so if you just inject a drug, you're going to get all of the drug at once, and then your body's going to get rid of it. So that's going to be a pretty high dose, and it's going to go away. If you take a pill, it's going to take a little time to come up to speed, and then you've also got to get through the gastrointestinal tract, which is going to digest it. So I'm sure you guys have all heard of, of drug patches. Um, these are typically made of polymers, and then they're infused with the drug, and then you rely on diffusion of the polymer of the drug out of that polymer to get through, and then diffusion through the skin, and then the bloodstream. So this is a great chemical engineering problem. Transport class, you'll talk all about diffusion and what controls that, how fast it goes. So you'll probably see this example again. Um, and then for this class, I want to talk about the, um, the balance. This is a great example of some integral or differential material balances because we've got some things changing in time and accumulating. All right, so Exelon is a path. There's, so there's a whole bunch of these, right? They do nicotine, birth control, Ritalin, I think, is on a patch now. This Exelon is uh, rivastigmine. It's this guy here, and it, um, it looks a little bit like acetylcholine with the nitrogens here. It, it fits into an acetylcholine receptor. Acetylcholine is your one of the neurotransmitters between your brain cells. Um, so Exelon is a medication that inhibits choline esterases. So your your uh, acetylcholine is the transmitter between the the neurons and uh, Acetylcholine breaks that down. If you block the acetyl, uh, sorry, the acetylcholine esterase breaks down the acetylcholine. If you can block the acetylcholine esterase, then uh, you can keep the acetylcholine around longer. So you're not actually messing with. Let's see. So here's my transmembrane uh, proteins, and I've got uh, acetylcholine, acetylcholine, and it's. Uh, being released from one cell and it's binding to these sensors on another cell. And this acetylcholine esterase is getting degraded by, sorry, the acetylcholine gets degraded by acetylcholine esterase to go away. But if we bring in this drug and the drug blocks acetylcholine esterase, we stop that and we keep the acetylcholine around longer. All right, so we went back a few steps. Biologists often like that, affecting one thing, affecting another, affecting all these feedback loops. So that's this problem. That's this Exelon, which I guess is treating Alzheimer's and Parkinson's now, and um, a little bit of dementia. So Exelon is a patch form of an Alzheimer's medication. It inhibits acetylcholine esterases in the brain to make higher levels of the neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. Let's say we load 60 milligrams of the drug into a patch. The drug is released at a rate of 25 times E to the minus 0.5 T milligrams <laughs> per day. So the rate changes because we're depleting the drug in the polymer, and so the rate's going to go down with time. Uh, let's see, T here is in <coughs> hours. T is in hours after application of the patch. What fraction of the drug is released after one week? Question number one. So how much drug gets released in one week? The you know, question you might want to ask is how when do I need to replace the patch? 
Uh, second question, the kidneys filter the drug out of the bloodstream. So the patch is putting it in, the kidneys are taking it out, five milligrams a day. How does the mass of drug in the bloodstream vary as a function of time after application of the patch? So there's the drug dose question. How much is in the blood? That's what you want to know. Um, let's see if it's going to do its job. At what time is the concentration highest? You might want to know how long is that going to take and, and how high is it going to be? That's going to be pretty important physiologically. And then. Um, this is the can be problem question. Is the problem well determined? We have enough information yet. Uh, which means what? What does that mean we do? Degrees of freedom. Excellent. Good. Everybody hear that? 
so final and initial mass in the patch. Uh, the final is actually kind of what we're looking for. Not exactly what fraction is released. So if we know how much is in there, final, we know how much is released. Or actually, how much is released is this this quantity here, the mass. The change of mass in the patch is how much is released, or the accumulation in the patch is going to be um, the, uh, the opposite of what's released. So the final length is initial. The initial is other 60 milligrams per K. So let's see, mass of drug initial is 60 milligrams. What's another way I can? Well, what's another way I know that 60 milligrams is the accumulation and not the in? Kind of looks like in, right? It says uh, the word in is there. 60 milligrams of the drug is loaded into the patch. So are you sure that's not the in? Okay, so the, the, the key thing we want to think about is the time. When does the 60 milligrams get loaded into the patch? Over time. Before and then, when does the releasing happen? During. During some time window, and then there's some finals. So you almost want to do um, with batch reactors. We have these cartoon forms. So before, you take the patch and you load it, and then during, we take the patch. We've got stuff coming out, and then after, maybe we peel the patch off and it's done. We ask how much is left. So we, in the beginning, we load and we get some initial mass of drug in D0. At the end, we've got some mass of drug final. And then in the middle, we've got this whole material balance going on. So this is this material balance goes from time 0 to time F. So this is going to be T0 is less than time, less than TF. This is some time before time 0. This is after time. Okay. I think about three different time periods, and this do this integral, we've got one particular time period. Okay, that's m day zero. How about uh, 25e to the minus 25t? Which term is that? M in. M in? Okay. M dot in? Who agrees with M dot in? Any other ideas? Joanna? The system is the patch. And this is going out. So here's my 25 e to the minus t over 2. This is out of the patch. It'll be into the buff, into the blood, and it'll be out of the patch. So it's m dot drug in equals 25 e to the minus t over 2. What else? Um, oh, no. no. I just wrote it. m dot out. This is out of the patch. OK, into the patch then. Nothing there. Reactions in the patch. Nothing there. So accumulation equals in minus out. We said there's no reaction. So mass of drug final minus mass of drug initial equals well, there's no in either. Minus out. 25e e to the minus t over 2. Integral t0 tf. Sorry, so this is uh, integral T0 TF M drug out DT. I should have reversed those. But that's it. Can we solve that? So the integral of an exponential is an exponential again, and then we pull out the uh, minus one half, we end up with a minus two times this minus 25 should get 50 e to the minus t over 2. Yes? That's the change in mass. The change in mass is the same as how much is released. And integrate from time 0 to time 10 days. If I call that days, so I get 50 e to the minus 10 over 2 e to the minus 5. Uh, minus 50 e to the zero. It's seven, not to be set to week to week. 
Ah, oh, weak. Thank you. I wish I had 10 days in a week. Okay, seven. Okay, so 50. Times e to the minus seven halves minus one. And e to the minus seven halves is 0 0.03. Minus 1 means uh, 0.96 times 50 is the change in mass. So I'm going to have uh, oops, that's a minus. So I'm going to get minus 48.5 milligrams released. All right, that's the accumulation. The change in mass is minus 48.5. So that's how much mass is removed in the that's how much of a change in the patch, so minus that is 48.5. That would be the uh, milligrams drug released. Yes? Questions? If I backed up a little bit here, I could have done uh, 50 e to the minus t over 2 minus 1, and I could actually plot this uh, if, I, if I left t in there.
could say this is e to the minus t final over 2 minus e to the 0 minus 5tf minus 0. e to the 0 is 1. This minus sign I can distribute in. And I get 50 times 1 minus e to the minus t final over 2 minus 5t final. Then we can plug in that 7 days, 50 1 minus e to the 7 halves minus 5 times 7. Okay, so we can get an equation for final mass of drug, and then we can plot final mass of drug versus time if we use this form with the time in it and we should get is something that shoots up and then eventually um, comes back down and eventually goes negative below zero which of course doesn't make any sense because you can't remove anything more from the kidney than is in the body. Um, yeah. How does the mass vary as a function of time? So that's it this expression and we can plot that. Um, at what time is the drug concentration highest? How do we find that point? Troy? By the fundamental paper of calculus, just take the derivative of both and it and set it equal to zero. Take the derivative, derivative's got to be equal to zero. So we take this equation, we would say dm final dt equals, and we set that to zero, and then we solve for t. We should get we should get t equals 3.22 if my numbers are correct. You think t equals 3.22? Anybody and else? Uh, and then plugging that in is like and plugging that into the integral, you should get a, a maximum concentration of 23.91 milligrams. This is about three. This is about seven. You think this is about 21 milligrams? Final. Uh, last thing is this well determined. Let's do uh, degrees of freedom on this last one. Variables. How many stream variables? One, two, I see stream two stream variables in and out. How many system variables? System variables are number of reactions plus number of things that accumulate. So in this case, we do have accumulation. So we have one, it's basically this final quantity, assuming you're given some initial condition. All right, equations. Uh, what do we got? Uh, flows. We got two. 25 e to the minus 2 and 5, so we got two flows. <coughs> Material balances. One, we got three and three. Over. 